it's really sad to think that many of these early women writers, and there were more women writing films in the early silent days than there were men. It was a wild west of a job. And so we always let women in in the beginning. And then when it becomes a business, we say, oh, no, 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 no. This is now a place where men can make money. You ladies should leave. From the Autry Museum, located on Tongva homelands in Los Angeles, California, join us in asking, what is a Western? Our guest today is Roseanne Welch. She's a former screenwriter and historian and a professor at the MFA program in screenwriting and TV writing at Stevens College. She's the editor of the book, When Women Wrote Hollywood, as well as the author of numerous other books that you can check out. But welcome. Thanks for joining us today, Roseanne. Thanks for asking me. I love to talk about women screenwriters. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, so we're going to focus on the, the, a subtopic within your the book you edited, uh, When Women Wrote Westerns. How do we see the history of TV and film differently when we learn about these women screenwriters who are often forgotten? And, um, and perhaps why were they forgotten in the first place? The why is always sad to learn, um, but we're learning it in all of our history classes, no matter what we teach in this country. And we're getting very good at that, right? We're learning that the people who told the stories were the winners. And in fact, there were many, many more stories that were left on the cutting room floor, if you will. So having different people write, in this case, we're discussing women, another gender looking at this perspective of the experience they had, right? All those men didn't come West by themselves. They generally brought women with them or met women here, right? Because nobody wants to be alone for 20 years of their life, right? <laughs> so they have a different perspective of what happened and including them in the story makes the story richer because we need to understand who really were the founders of our country and who were the people who caused the trouble when they came out here, right? If we're colonizing an area that was already inhabited, women were part of that too. So women have to take a shot about that um, and recognize that in their own privilege, they came and thought this place belonged to them. So seeing that from their eyes, I think is really interesting. The question about why we forget women screenwriters is, is bothering us for a long time. And one of the things we fall back on is this thing called unreliable narrators. And it's really sad to think that many of these early women writers, and there were more women writing films in the early silent days than there were men. It was, it was a wild west of a job. And so we always let women in in the beginning. We did the same thing in aviation. Tons of female flyers. They're doing all kinds of contests flying from here to Cleveland. I don't know why Cleveland, but it was hub, right? Um, all these contests. And then when it becomes a business, we say, oh, no, 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 no. This is now a place where men can make money. You ladies should leave. And we essentially leave them behind. So one, whenever we became a business, both in aviation and in Hollywood, they took women who had been producers, they'd been directors, they'd written their own material. And the, the guys running the studio suddenly said, um, here's your new contract. You're now a junior writer and you can work with this guy. And they were like, Thank you. I'll go back to New York and I'll write novels, right? So that's Anita Luce and Gentlemen Prefer Blondes and, you know, Frances Marion, who's probably the most famous early female screenwriter. They just started writing novels where they could, be, again, be in charge of the whole story. Mm -hmm. You know, why should they be treated that way? And then this unreliable narrator thing is a new thing I learned when I got involved in academia. And that's when you look at the interviews that happen with the men who founded Hollywood, they forget to mention the women who did it with them or they mention women without mentioning the names. Um, one of my favorite sad examples is a woman named Jeannie McPherson who wrote several Westerns under Cecil B. DeMille. And you know, if students study film history, they've all heard of Cecil B. DeMille and they rarely hear of Jeannie McPherson. But on almost any movie he made that made money, she wrote it, but she died young. And he lived on another 30 years and he did a oral history. And when they asked him about working with her, he said, she wasn't a great writer. I kept her around because she needed a job, uh, but I did most of the work. And that's what goes down in the history books because she didn't get to tell her side. And so to me, that's the saddest part of this is they, they disappeared and nobody, they didn't even know they were going to disappear. I think that will be familiar to a lot of people from a lot of different perspectives, those types of, those types of stories. So when we think about Westerns in particular, which seems like such a male oriented genre, the cowboy is such a looming figure in, in that genre. How, how do we see them differently when we focus on the stories that women wrote or that are less often told? 
certainly the, the difference is that when we think of a female focused story versus a male focused story, and this is unfair to young boys and to men, we teach men in our literature, in our drama, in our movies, we teach them that the only way for them to succeed is to master a particular weapon. Of course, in the West, it's the rifle, it's the pistol, it's the, it's the gun. And take on the bad guy all alone. We're doing high noon. It's me and you. That's it. If I die, the whole world falls apart. And that's a lot of pressure to put on one character. Whereas female stories are generally centered in, I have come to this new place with a bunch of other people. We are a community and we must all rise together. We must all help each other, right? One of the great comparisons people will make, and I adore Star Wars, and we're going to talk about Star Wars and how that's really a Western. Okay. Um, I adore Star Wars, but of course that's the lesson that you know young Luke Skywalker learns. Whereas you compare that to, and there's a lovely TED talk that does this, The Wizard of Oz, which is a female heroine. And what she does is she takes the group around her, empowers all of them to do their best, and as a team, they succeed. <laughs> and those that's a different look at our West, but we know the West did not survive because one or two men took on one or two other people. It survived because great communities of people came together right, and did that. And on the flip side, when we think about Native Americans, they all fought together as well. It wasn't just the male warriors. The women were upholding all these things, um, and they also took the brunt of the disease that was passed and all those things. So the community idea is really what I think we all succeed at. And by not seeing that side of a story, we're, we're telling men they have too much work to do all by themselves, and that's not fair. That's a great way to, t- <laughs> to tell it. I'll, I'll, I'll teach my daughter that. Um, <laughs> um, you mentioned the silent era being this really open and wild west period of film writing. But if we sort of sketch a line across the 20th century and even now into the 21st century, um, how did women's opportunities kind of wax and wane in different periods? Uh, or what, what oppor- new opportunities opened up? What what things were foreclosed. But how did those kind of trends go across the history of film? Oh, wonderful. Um, well, first of all, of course, in the silent era, it was everybody going at it and having fun until there was too much money in it. And then the women segued out. Uh, again, they went into novels and literature, although a few people survived that period, but they weren't writing Westerns, right? Except, as you all know from the Autry Museum, Betty Burbage was writing Giantry movies, right? So there were some women Lee Brackett, again, who's coming handy when we talk about Star Wars, um, was a Western novelist and wrote Western serializations and things. So we have some women, but it becomes a dude thing, right? And this is a problem for writers all the time. You get pigeonholed just like actors do. Oh, you did that one movie and you're brilliant at it? We want you to do 14 of the same movie, right? It's very few people that get to be William Goldman and do a variety of different things. You have to really reach that peak. So women, it wanes in movies, although B-serials have a little more opportunity for them. And then yes, TV is invented. And TV is a place where a lot of these women move because they get, we're doing Westerns on TV. We start to do a few less Westerns, even in the film world, as science fiction and stuff takes over. And the women move into television and they're doing episodes of Bonanza and Wagon Train and High Chaparral. Again, you have the David Dordert papers there, which are so interesting to read because High Chaparral is a really cool show when it comes to a female who owned the ranch and then she marries. She's, she's an indigenous woman. She marries a white guy. And then he co-powers it with her. Really fascinating story. Um, so the women start writing those kinds of things. And eventually in the TV realm, they move into places where I, I always rank DC Fontana because here's a woman who wrote Westerns on TV and then she got involved in Star Trek which as you know, was sold as wagon train to the stars. Mm-hmm. So she's just writing Westerns with guys in you know, tight suits. Um, and, and really the sad thing about that is it takes years for people to realize DC Fontana is a girl. Because one of the things we, that producers and publishers still ask women to do when they're writing male focused stories is to use their initials because they don't think boys or men will read or watch something by Dorothy Christine Fontana. I can't remember Christine's middle name. I don't remember, but you see. <laughs> Same thing is, and you think we're done with that, except my kid grew up, he's 22. He's the generation that read Harry Potter by J.K. Rowling. I mean, come on, could we just not use women's name, right? I grew up reading The Outsiders by S.E. Hinton. It's ridiculous, right? But so these women have moved into TV. They start doing these other sorts of Westerns. 
Um, and then of course, Lee Brackett moves back into movies when she writes Empire Strikes Back. Um, but also think about the era of TV as it expands and grows, they're done telling the same repetitive stories. So then we're gonna get Beth Sullivan and Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman, right? Mm -hmm. Which takes the West from that female perspective and is based in real life, a couple of women who couldn't be doctors in the East, right? But it's still a Western. We got horses, we got cute guys and you know, outlaw outfits. It's a Western, it's just mm -hmm. a female experience. So they see much more opportunity there. Um, and then slowly, maybe they're peeling back into movies when it comes to Westerns, but not as much as we'd like. Right. No, thank you. That's a, that's a great timeline. When you look at all of the hi histories and biographies that you've learned about of women screenwriters, are there a couple in particular that you wish more people knew? Maybe these are some of the ones you've mentioned already, but are there, are there a couple that you just want to sort of shout from the rooftops? These, this, is, uh, this is a classic. This is a person who should be on the, on the marquee. Oh, yeah. Well, obviously, I, could, I did mention Frances Marion. She wrote a series of Westerns for her husband, Fred Thompson, who was a Western star, right? He was right up there rivaling William F. Hart, moving into the, the talky world. The problem is he died young. And when he died, she lost her interest in writing Westerns because, of course, that was too reminiscent of him. They were right up there with, you know, Pickford and Fairbanks, except they were a writer-actor team. So I think Frances Marion is someone people have to look more into. I love Jeannie McPherson and she wrote several Westerns, always about a woman going out West and having experience and surviving the West, which is really a Western story. A lone person, doesn't have to be a boy or girl, a lone person challenges themselves and succeeds. Mm -hmm. um, so I think she's a really big name. Um, we mentioned Betty. I think we sometimes have to think about women who wrote Western novels, which were then adapted by men but the core characters are gonna have come from the female perspective. So for me, that's Edna Ferber. And it's always weird that she wrote, you know, So Big and Cimarron and Giants, which is mm -hmm. this huge sprawling thing. And she's an Easterner. She, she's a member of the Algonquin Round Table. She hangs around with, you know, Harpo Marx and, you know, all, Alexander Woolcott. And she's doing all that witty New York stuff, but she's writing about this period, which mm -hmm. is to me reminiscent of the fact that Teddy Roosevelt, right, is just a straight New Yorker, but he comes mm -hmm. out here and becomes I'm the West dude and I'm going to do all that stuff. So mm -hmm. anyone can claim to sort of own the West because it becomes our American myth and everybody mm -hmm. wants to be tied to that. Mm -hmm. So I think Edna Ferber is somebody people should read. And then really in the very modern day, what I think is really interesting is there's a show on uh, sci-fi called uh, Winona Earp and it's out of Canada. So we have a Canadian, Emily Andrus, and so a female writer. She's taking a Western icon, White Earp, and she's flipping it and giving his great granddaughter the job of using his big rifle, which is called Peacemaker, and killing the ghosts of all the bad guys that Wyatt Earp was once up against because they come back, right? Mm -hmm. So all, what a flip of our mm -hmm. story, right? I think that's a really cool, and people sort of dismiss it, but it also has a really lovely LGBTQ um, storyline because they give Winona a sister who's gay. And she mm -hmm. and the sheriff, who's a girl, are a partnership. And you're like, mm -hmm. whoa. Girl sheriff, having a relationship, the whole thing is like so all this new stuff. And yet, there's a really cool book called The Roaring Camp. It's about the gold rush by Susan Johnson. Using primary documents, she documented all these people who truly lived in the gold rush. Mm -hmm. And I remember this great team of two men who ran a restaurant for like 40 years together and they lived together. Of course, there's no paperwork that says they were a couple because nobody's right. going to write that down in the day. But you know that's what was going on. And mm -hmm. like, all these people occupy the West mm -hmm. and we don't talk about them. And for whatever reason, maybe because women are forgotten a lot, they also like to look for those other forgotten stories and bring them to light. So mm -hmm. I think Emily's a pretty cool person and I'm really interested in a Canadian looking at American history. It's very interesting. Mm -hmm. Usually the, the directors get become the heroes of film history. What's different between the history of screenwriters and the history of directors or actors or actresses in, I mean, in what gets remembered? Of course. We always grant you that people go first to see an actor or an actress. They fall for that person. That's who they're going to see the movie for. That's just the truth. The whole director-writer thing makes you crazy. Back in the day, they recognized writers more. Writers were in Photoplay magazine when they had marriages or they were taking vacations. We read about people like Lorna Moon and um, Anita Luce, obviously, all these people. And then what happens is the auteur theory shows up. And the auteur theory blows us away because Francois Truffaut over there in France decides directors are the real author of a movie, even though 
they don't write anything unless they're writer directors. And I always tell my students, the word writer still comes before director in that phrase. Um, you know, there's a classic Robert Riskin story. He's the guy who wrote all the Frank Capra movies. Um, and it's an anecdotal, the idea that one day he got so mad about the Capra touch, they handed in 200 blank pages. And he said, go ahead, put your touch on that. Because you can't direct nothing, right? Um, so there's a lot of reasons why in the 40s-ish, we start getting these celebrity directors. And the problem with teaching directors as the heads of their movies is that they largely were men. So we're teaching the great male history you know, of the world, again, when many of those stories were written by women, right? I always, I kind of pick on Hitchcock because it's Joan Harrison who wrote several of his films and got an Oscar nomination for Rebecca, right? But you don't think about Joan Harrison movies, you think about Hitchcock movies, right? And so that to me is really unfair. Um, and there's also this concept that in the world of Hollywood, directors are so masculine since mostly men did that. And the writers are like the girls of the, of the town, right? They're the female part of the team, the heart versus the brawn. And that's really stupid because artists, male or female, are more sensitive. That's why they're artists. Um, that doesn't mean they should be considered any less in the hierarchy of the creation of this story. For me, they, they should always be considered more because when you quote movies, you're quoting dialogue. Those are your favorite lines. And the writer is the one who did that. Um, so it's to me something I'm still battling. Even teaching students, they'll come to my classes and I ask them to name their top five movies mm -hmm. and then who directed them and then who wrote them. And they can always name the five directors. And unless it's a writer director, they don't remember who wrote the movie. And I have to tease them because they're coming to become writers <laughs> and they haven't focused on the work of other writers. We should know the body of work of screenwriters as well as we know the body of work of writers like Hemingway or Faulkner. We should be able to say, and we do that with like Nora Ephron, right? We're pretty good with that, um, but very few. Nancy Myers, we can kind of kind of know with that. Um, again, if you study silent films, you know an Anita Luce film, you know a Francis Marion film. The more you see their work, the more you recognize it. So for me, we have to start focusing. The other thing that makes me crazy that I must change someday is both IMDb and Wikipedia. When you get the little Google quick version, when you do a search, they give you the movie name and the director. The writer is not in that quick Google search. You have to go to the page to get it. And I'm like, oh, come on, add one more line. It won't <laughs> I'm glad we're giving you this platform to, to put this slogan and maybe <laughs> maybe you can make a poster or something. <laughs> um, but no, it's an important part of the history and, and such a crucial part of every film. You, you've mentioned being being a professor of, of aspiring screenwriters, you know, as they look to the fu their future careers, um, what opportunities do you see or challenges that they, and maybe particularly your women students will face, but probably also your, your men students. What, what looks like it may be changing? What, what challenges are they facing? What, you know, how are our technologies changing that may affect this? What, what do you see looking forward? So many things. Um, I think what's a good thing to look forward to is the studios are now recognizing, thanks to Wonder Woman and Black Panther, there are audiences for stories that are not from the main quote unquote norm. So now they're hungry for those because they want that money, right? It's always about money. We always know that. It is a business about money. Um, the art is secondary, which is a bummer. But people are beginning to look for them, but they're still hesitant. They're still a little worried. So you've got to really be confident and you've got to be really well researched on whatever the story is that you want to tell. Also demographically, you really have to think about who is this audience. You want some proof about where they are and all that stuff. And a, and a lot of writers are learning to, you have to do, you know, it's, it's show business. You have to do half business, half show. And we, don't, we like to avoid the business. But if you want to get someone to do a new kind of story, you have to do that. For women particularly though, we know the world is still a boys club. Um, and so you have to be confident and you don't want to be overly aggressive because then people say bad things about you. And yet, if you're not, you don't get through the sort of the clutter of everything. One of the cool things that we teach about is we all know the, the hero's journey, which is what I talked about with Luke Skywalker. But the heroine's journey is a thing that we teach, right? And Maureen Murdoch came with that, came up with that. The heroine's journey, of course, is about a female character, but it's about what women learn from society, which is generally, if you want to succeed, you have to act like a man. So you, you separate, your beginning of that movie is you separate from your girlishness and you start doing dude stuff. And by the time you're done with the movie, you figure it out, you know, the only way to actually get forward is to use the talents that I have, perhaps inherently, because I'm a female. And when I reconnect 
to how female I am, then I succeed. So to me, that's what women have to remember to do. Um, and, and there's a lot of dudes in town, really good guys, um, who are learning that, wait a minute, we've, we've, we're used to talking over women and all that sort of thing. And we have to stop and let people finish their thoughts before we dive in with something else and then people forget things. And then women also have to be good. You know, the classic story is that you might pitch an idea and no one takes it up. And 15 minutes later, a guy pitches it in the writer's room. And then everyone's like, oh yeah, let's go with that. And then you have to say, that's exactly what I said 10 minutes ago. And then they'll all kind of, oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> right? You have to claim your talent or other people are gladly walk over it. So I think those are behavioral things, right? But we don't want to, we don't have to be super dude-like to succeed that way. You just have to be strong and know that you're good at what you do um, and you'll succeed. But also we're looking for new stories and the newer, most interesting stories, they're gonna break through because the audience is so diverse and so wide. And now we're international, right? With Netflix and streaming and all that stuff, we can think about people we haven't covered before. And we know around the world, other people will be interested in that. In the same way we're watching Japanese anime and you know Korean um, telenovelas and all that stuff. What are the examples of the heroine's journey? What are some of those, those stories that are in the heroine's journey um, format, template? I'm curious. Oh, I would say, well, obviously The Wizard of Oz, like I said. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. In a TV world, we claim that for Buffy the Vampire Slayer, mm -hmm. right? Very much so about that. Um, the joke becomes, you could say Scooby-Doo does that. <laughs> <laughs> it's anything that involves a team coming together. And so in a funny way, that can also be sometimes a male focused team. You think about mm -hmm. war movies, they're all about a team of people coming together mm -hmm. for the betterment of each other, even mm -hmm. though they're like the most dude movies. Mm -hmm. um, you could say the same thing about Westerns, if it's a group of people, an Oregon Trail kind of thing, or a group mm -hmm. of men in a town, or the sheriff and a couple of his buddies. The heroine, in terms of pulling away from being female and then pulling back into it, that tends to happen more often in sort of a romantic comedy or something like The Intern, where she's trying to figure out how to be a leader of these other men. And then she has to realize it's about the nurturing that I do that is better than me being more loud and annoying and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I can make a list for you that I can have. Okay, <laughs> great. Well, I'll claim, I'll claim Wizard of Oz and Buffy as Westerns. Um, I think Sunnyvale, Sunnyvale is that, I think that's in California. We can call it a Western. It is, it is, so. it is. that's true. <laughs> It's about making the town safe for the new inhabitants. Right. So are there some ways that we, as like the work you've been doing with your research, um, the, in terms of revising uh, the, those kind of incomplete histories of the film industry, what steps can we take to, to, to actually repair that and, and have a more accurate narrative of the past? Oh, wow. Well, of course, hire more women writers. <laughs> <laughs> Step one, to get more of those stories out, hire more underrepresented voices to tell us the stories we haven't heard before. And once we've done that, we have to preserve this material. One of the issues, again, with why we don't remember these women is when we started preserving films and doing the Library of Congress and the 100 Years of all of that stuff, people kind of pushed the, that wasn't important. It was Charlie Chaplin and these other people, and we preserved all their material. We didn't really think about that when it comes to stuff done by women. And women are terrible at keeping track of their own archives. So many of these women threw away material. They cleaned out their houses. They were busy with kids. They didn't want all this clutter around when their career was over. And it disappeared. I mean, there's a great story, Bess Meredith, um, who wrote many, many films in the silent era. And then she married Michael Curtiz, who is the director of Casablanca. And there, as people study Casablanca, often he would, he would be asked a question on the set and had to leave to figure it out. And they knew he went home to call his wife to help him figure out the story problem, then he'd come back. And her son wrote a biography of her. He also became a TV writer. Problem was, he never thought to ask his mother about her career. When she was older, it was like, I didn't imagine she did anything interesting. So even within our own families, we don't talk about the work that we do, women particularly. And that's a mistake because then the stories die. So we need, you know, in the places where we have things like the Library of Congress and the, all the catalogs of film, we have to start going backwards and preserving as much of this female work as we can and work by African-Americans. We have a lot of African-American early screenwriters where we know they existed because there are, there are advertisements for their movies, mm -hmm. but the movies don't exist anymore. So how can we study stuff that we can't have access to? Mm. I know it's always so heartening when something turns up that was thought to be lost and there may still be some treasures out there and people are discovering new new things every day and that's what you know of course of interest to us at the museum uh 
finding those rare, rare voices that luckily were preserved in some way or other and, and just bringing them to light more. Well, and that's what I always tell students, too. If you go to places like museums, you know, when my students are in town, they, they're low residency, but they come in town one, twice a year. And we'll go to the Autry, we'll go to the Herrick, we'll go to different places. But what, even long before I did this job, I would go to the Autry with my son, because, of course, cowboy stuff, cool. But also, you look at the photographs of who were the cowboys, right? And we all know they weren't John Wayne. We all know mm -hmm. that wasn't who it was, right? They were the Mexican-Americans, and they were Chinese-Americans. And you see that in the photographs. But movies came along and made them all Caucasian. And that's ridiculous, but that became the myth, right? Mm -hmm. So the more we look at the real history, the more we can tell those real stories. I love research. <laughs> I love museums for that. <laughs> Me <very> too. <laughs> Well, thanks so much for joining us. It was such a wonderful conversation. And I, especially, I think I'll take away this idea of a sort of community type stories in, in Westerns, particularly from, from our perspective. What are those Western films that feature that kind of community story? And is that a sort of more feminine point of view or, or a kind of women's view of the West? That's going to stick with me, but as will many other points. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for asking me. I love to talk about this clearly. And I love the Autry Museum. <laughs> Thanks. The Autry Museum of the American West thanks our members and supporters.